Welcome to another edition of the Morning Devotional. My name is Pastor William Hill, the pastor of Providence Presbyterian Church located in Evansville, Indiana. It's great to have you here with me for a Friday, July 14th, 2023. This is edition number 117 of season eight as we continue looking at the Westminster Confession of Faith. We are in chapter 21, and today we'll take up paragraph number four. Let's pray first, and then we'll look at this paragraph. Father, we come again to your word, and we come uh, knowing that we are in desperate need of the guidance that it delivers to us as pilgrims in this world, in a fallen world wrecked by sin. We have a great need of the light that lights our path. That light is given to us in your word. It guides and directs us. It tells us how we ought to live before you and how we ought to worship you. And so we pray that you would help us, that you by your spirit would teach us, that you'd forgive us for the ways in which we do fall short of many of these things. May you help us that we would walk according to all that you have written, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, paragraph number four continues in some sense the idea that has been mentioned already in paragraph number three, prayer with thanksgiving being one special part of religious worship. Now in paragraph four, We are told here in this paragraph for whom and for what we ought to pray. And so here in this summary of this paragraph, we get those two ideas presented. So paragraph number four of chapter 21, prayer is to be made for things lawful and for all sorts of men living or that shall live hereafter, but not for the dead, not for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. Now, it's a brief paragraph, but it is loaded with uh, very practical helps as to uh, our focus in prayer. We note right away that the paragraph tells us that we are to pray. Prayer is to be made for things lawful. That is simply to say that we cannot pray for things that God has forbidden. We cannot pray that God would grant to us the blessing of His Spirit to commit adultery. We cannot pray that God would guide and direct us in our endeavors to sin against him. That is not a lawful prayer. That goes contrary to the very nature and purpose, the very nature and person of God. In 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 14, we read, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. And so here in these verses, we are told plainly that our prayers, whether in corporate worship or in private worship, should be filled with those things that are agreeable to the very will of God. Our shorter catechism defines prayer for us in in, in just that manner. Uh, What is prayer? Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God for things agreeable to His will in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of His mercies. And so we can't pray for things that are unlawful. We can't pray for things that are clearly taught in Scripture uh, that are sinful. We can't ask God to help us in matters that would go contrary to God's will. That defeats the whole point of prayer, and that is, of course, to bring our wills and our minds in conformity to the infinite will of God. And so this is what is prohibited. We cannot pray for things unlawful, but we can indeed pray for all sorts of men living or that shall live hereafter. Now, Paul tells Timothy as much in 1 Timothy chapter 2, um, as he's giving instructions to him about the order of the church and how it should be run, he says in the second chapter, verse 1, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, thanks, uh, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. This is simply to say that it is lawful to pray for all people. And we do that, of course, and I think that this is automatically understood by Christians, we, we do pray for all sorts of people. We, 
We are to pray for our leaders of our country, wherever country you may find yourself. You are to pray for them. What should you pray? Well, you would pray that God would guide them and direct them as ministers of God who have been appointed to that office, that they would serve you, the church, well in their office, that you would, you would pray that God would open their eyes and their ears to the truth of the Word of God, to the gospel itself, that you would pray that God would bind their hands, that they might not do any evil thing against the people of God. There's a myriad of things that you can pray for when it comes to our leaders. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the church. We pray for their spiritual well-being. We pray for their physical well-being. We pray for our family members and friends. We pray for those who do not know the Lord. We ask that God would open their eyes and their ears to the truth of the gospel. These things are all lawful. We can pray for all of these things uh, within the confines of both private and public worship. But we can also pray for those who will live after us. We can pray for the future generation of the church. We can pray for our unborn children. I know parents who have done that to the child still in the womb, and they pray uh, for them that they might come to an early understanding of the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have an example of that, don't we, in John chapter 17, Christ's high priestly prayer there as he's about to go and offer himself a ransom for many. He's praying to his Father. And this entire chapter is extremely encouraging because the Savior is praying for his people. He's praying for those who will live after him. John chapter 17 and verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that they would, they, that, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so he's praying for future generations of his people that he's going to the cross to redeem. And so we pray for that. We pray for future generations of the church. We pray that the Lord would raise up laborers in the next generation to pastor churches to lead and guide as elders and deacons to be missionaries into the world to be faithful parents and faithful husbands and wives faithful children that are raised in society to be salt and light in the world in which we live there's many things that we can pray for for the next generation of god's people however we are prohibited from praying for the dead there's no use and, in fact, no point in praying uh, for the dead because there is no hope for them now. Either A, they are living in that eternal hope in the presence of Christ, or they are living in that eternal damnation and a, a, a eternal death in which they have, due to their rejection of Christ and the hope of the gospel and their sin, they are in, in, enduring the consequence of that in hell. Praying for them is not going to do any good. It will not relieve them from the, from the torments of hell. It will not bring them out of hell. Now, this is one of the errors of the Roman church in which uh, they teach that you can pray for those who are in so-called purgatory. Well, there is no purgatory, so it's somewhat pointless to pray that. But, but there's this idea that you can pray for the dead, that somehow God does and indeed works um, for those who are dead. And in fact, that is not the case. We have an example of this in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 21, uh, or chapter 12, uh, verses 21 through 23. The chapter, of course, is one of the darker chapters in the life of Samuel, or the life of David. Uh, Nathan the prophet has confronted him with his sin and conspiracy and murder and adultery. And, well, God deals, he forgives him, of course, but there's a consequence to the sin and that consequence was the death of his son. And so we read in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. Um, then his servant said to him, that is, David, what is this thing that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child when he was alive, but when the child died, you arose and ate food. He said, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So David ceases this spiritual discipline of fasting, weeping, praying for his, for his child who is not yet dead, but as soon as it did die, um, as God said, um, he ceased doing these things. So there's no point to pray for the dead. They have received their reward, uh, either eternal blessing or eternal damnation. You're also not to pray for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. 
Again, in 1 John chapter 5, um, verse 16, there we read, if anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. Now, this is a difficult phrase in the confession. What are we talking about? Well, it's likely, of course, that they're referencing the unpardonable sin, the sin that, of which there can be no repentance. The question, of course, is not that that exists. The question is, how will we know? And so we need to be very careful that we do not jump to conclusions about people and just make that blanket statement, well, I'm not praying for them because they've committed the sin unto death. Well, you may or may not know that. And, and so it's very important that you give a lot of benefit here, benefit of the doubt here in, in charity. Um, Chad Van Dixhorn in his commentary, he does talk about this in that vein when he says on page 282 in his commentary, Confessing the Faith, he says, it is possible to end on a, is it possible to end on a more solemn note? Actually, yes, the Westminster divines mention that there, is, there are also those who have hardened themselves. There is one sin that leads to death, and that is the sin of unrepentant opposition to God. If that sin continues for all of life, then it will prove to be a sin that leads to death, as the Apostle John calls it. How do we know when a sinner has reached the point of spiritual death prior to their physical death? Can we know this? Perhaps this knowledge was obtained only by the prophets and apostles who sometimes spoke and acted with confidence about the spiritual state of some of their contemporaries. We ourselves should be careful in judging the spiritual state of others. And normally, we would continue to pray for the salvation of the lost no matter what the circumstances. And so again, I just warn you and remind you to be very careful about exercising this final phrase here in paragraph number four. And it's probably better, in fact, to give the benefit of the doubt in such a way that you continue to pray for those sinners, those people that have indeed hardened themselves against God and continue to pray for God to rescue them from their sin. And so this paragraph gives to us the what and the whom of which we can pray and should pray, whether it's privately and more to the point of the chapter, publicly in corporate worship. Now, one of the things that I do here at Providence and the people that watch these videos that are members of this church. They know this to be true. Um, during the pastoral prayer, I, I cover these things. Uh, I pray for our country, our leaders. Um, I, I spend time there. And then I pray for the church within our country, not just this church, but the, all the churches that faithfully uphold the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for God to bless them and keep them, to purify them, to strengthen them, to cause them to seek first his kingdom. I pray for brothers and sisters in other countries in more difficult scenarios of which they live that we in the United States don't really experience. I come back and I pray for the specific needs of the congregation at Providence and then we conclude with the Lord's Prayer. All of these things are rooted in the confessional directives to pray for all men, those living and those that will live, that the glory of God might be seen and demonstrated, His will performed, and not only in His church, but also in the lives of many uh, throughout the world. And so we do this uh, in agreement with that which God has clearly taught us in His Word. Well, I trust these times are helpful for you. I hope they are. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave me a note. The way to reach me is there before you on the screen. And so until the Monday edition, when we continue looking at chapter 21, may the Lord bless you today. May he strengthen you by his grace. May you find yourself in his worship this coming Lord's Day. God bless.